Hello, everyone. We are back with our 2020 Latin American Space Challenge Conference. And now we will have Rasmus Pedersen from a um, Danstar. It's a uh, rocketry group from, from uh, Denmark. Uh, Rasmus also works in the booster di di division from the Copenhagen suborbitals. And uh, he will give a presentation to us about Dragonfly, the bipropellant uh, rocket that was launched at Tail Rock 2020. So, Rasmus, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And uh, we are very happy to have you here. So, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to to present our our experience here at the Latin American uh, Space Challenge. Nice. Thank you so much. You can start. Thank you. All right. So um, contrary, uh, kind of opposite to what you just heard from from Adam Trompo, I'm I'm coming from the other side of the fence, so to speak. Uh, my name is Rasmus. I'm the project manager of uh, the Dragonfly project, which has been Dance Stars undertaken for the last few years. And I'll be telling you about the launch of the first European uh, student researched and developed rocket, uh, by liquid rocket at uh, Euro 2020. So I think it makes sense just in the beginning to go over what even is Dance Star. So it is uh, an operation, it's short for Danish Student Association for Rocketry. And it was founded four years ago in 2016 with the original goal of launching a recoverable by liquid rocket. And, and that was it, uh, no more, no less. Back in 2017, we started working on the uh, Dragonfly project as kind of a small group. And we've since grown quite a bit into five different sub teams, which are mechanical division, the electronics, the software, telemetry, and marketing. We have around uh, 35 active members uh, now, and that's approximately the same amount of people we had when we uh, uh, ended the Dragonfly project. So uh, we're looking forward to, to starting the next project with approximately uh, as many members. So, so the Dragonfly project was uh, de uh, a development project of Danstar's first uh, liquid rocket, actually first rocket uh, ever, and. In developing the, the rocket, we also had to develop some key technologies uh, in terms of launch infrastructure. Because like I just said, uh, this was Danstar's first project. So we didn't really have, have anything uh, supporting the launch uh, of a rocket uh, of this complexity. So we also had to figure out how to do all of that from scratch, uh, more or less. And in the beginning, our goal was actually to compete at the Spaceport America Cup in the 30,000 feet category in the hybrid liquid category. And that then since changed, uh, our original goal was to compete this year in the competition, but unfortunately it, it got canceled due to COVID. So after it got canceled, we were of course very saddened because we were looking forward to launch. Uh, and but of course we completely understood uh, the reason for the cancellation of the competition. Anyhow, we reached out to ESA and basically asked them why this we didn't have a, a student rocketry competition here in Europe. Uh, because now we, we knew that a lot of European rocket teams actually uh, were looking forward to launching at Spaceborne Rocket Cup. So quite a lot of these uh, rocket teams within Europe had more or less launch ready rockets uh, that now didn't have a place to launch. So this was kind of the, the story that we gave to ESA and, and they quickly got back to us and and set us up with an organization called Portugal Space, uh, who were looking to basically expand their network within uh, student rocketry. So they saw this as a perfect opportunity to host uh, a rocketry challenge in Europe. And together with Copenhagen Suborbitals and Propulse from uh, NTNU in Norway, we uh, laid the, like the groundwork for this competition where later on, uh, Copenhagen's Orbitals, Portugal Space, and some other organizations uh, picked up on it and, and actually had it become a, a reality. And just for, for this year's instance of the competition, the, the rules were largely inspired by the Spaceport America Cup, of course, because all of this happened in a very na narrow time frame. Um, 
our contact to ASA happened back in February this year, more or less immediately after we heard that the Spaceport America Cup had been cancelled. So this entire uh, undertaking of, of having this competition um, took uh, took less than, than a year, basically. So it's all very, very uh, inspiring to be a part of. So again, just to give you some, some sense of scale uh, for the Dragonfly project, which is a bilingual project, uh, it started uh, formally back in September 2018. And it ended in this November here in 2020 with a debriefing meeting where we went through the technical details of launch. So when you do the subtraction, you end up with uh, a project which lasted two years, one month, and 26 days. And doing the math, you quickly see that uh, that's quite a lot of time. And especially the, the hour mark is quite interesting. Um, 19,000 hours uh, spent on the project and then divided that out or multiplied that out on, on all of the people working on the project. So, so quite obviously, it's it's a massive uh, massive project, but uh, yeah, we managed to go through with it. That's amazing. So just to give you an overview of the Dragonfly rocket, we'll start from the nose cone to the right. So in the nose cone, we have our recovery compartment, which has two parachutes, a drogue chute, and a main chute. The drogue chute is to be deployed at apogee, and then the main chute is to be deployed at uh, around 500 meters above ground level. Moving one step down, we have a boilerplate payload. We had to have this payload as a requirement from the rules at Space Program Maker Cup, but we did not want to invest any time into developing an interesting payload because we were also developing this liquid rocket from scratch and uh, we prioritized the liquid rocket basically. So we just put in a, a dummy boilerplate payload that was just a four kilogram mass and no more than that. One step down, we have the avionics section. This is the smallest part of the rocket, but also one of the most important ones. Uh, this part of the rocket. Uh, contains the engine controller and the telemetry units and um, the power supply systems for uh, the rest of the rocket. So this is what makes us uh, able to actually control the rocket uh, prior to launch and during flight receive telemetry data. Going another step down, we have a pressure feed system. So Dragonfly uh, runs on a pressure fed cycle. So we need a high pressure system above the propellant tanks. And this is what you see here. It starts out at 300 bars. And by the end of flight, it uh, it uh, like when when the tanks are depleted, it's around uh, 50 bar left in the system. Then we have a common bulkhead propellant tank. So uh, the tank is actually one unit, but it has a dividing plate between the two volumes. So the oxidizer for the rocket is nitrous oxide, and the fuel is isopropyl alcohol, uh, which are then divided into two compartments inside the tank, and then they have passed through piping such that we can lead. Uh, the pressure and gas into one compartment and then uh, have a feed, uh, have a pass through pipe uh, for liquid for the other compartment passing through each other, so to speak. It's a bit complicated. Um, then moving one step down, we have the liquid feed system. This is the part of the rocket that controls the flow of propellant into the engine. So here, the two most notable components are, uh, are the main valves, uh, the oxidizer and the fuel main valve. These are the two components that are responsible for engine startup um, and basically keeping the engine running. One more step down, we have a 3D printed uh, regeneratively cooled engine. So it's a stainless steel unit, which, been, which has been 3D printed. And then it's kept cool by running the fuel, so the isopropyl alcohol, around a cooling jacket around the combustion chamber. So this is, of course, uh, an undressed version of the rocket, so to speak. And when it's actually cladded, you can see this picture we took just immediately before putting it into the flight crate before leaving for Portugal. Here, it doesn't have the fins mounted, but you get a sense of scale for the rocket. It's uh, around four and a half meters long, and the diameter is uh, 18 centimeters. So, so it's, quite, it's quite big. And now to the actual launch. So. I would like to say that it went smooth and we had no problems, but you can probably guess that this is not true. Um, we actually had quite a lot of problems uh, on launch. And among these, we saw an issue with the fueling system, which failed on the launch pad. We had an ignition error, meaning the rocket did not start uh, quite literally. Uh, and then after we eventually got the rocket launched, we had a deployment failure of the main parachute. So quite a lot of things uh, went wrong. But since we had done so much testing and so much practice from home uh, in 
For example, we did a vertical test. We did several vertical tests of the rocket on a static test bench just to get into the like the flow of fueling the rocket on the launch pad. Uh, we were quite confident in, in our ability to, to navigate around the, the failure in the, in the fueling system. So we managed to circumvent this. The ignition system, we also found a solution for. And then the, the deployment of the main parachute, uh, I, I guess I'll show you the, the aftermath uh, by the end of this uh, presentation. So the fueling system, which failed, uh, I'll just briefly explain to you how the fueling system works. So at the bottom of the propellant tank, we have a check valve, which, for, and this is for the nitrous side. We have a check valve, which is a one-way valve. So this allows us to put liquid into the rocket, and it doesn't allow the liquid to go back out because it's a one-way valve, only goes one way, which is into the rocket. During fueling on the first attempt, this valve uh, got stuck, basically. So, so it did not close, meaning that the, the liquid, which was supposed to stay inside the rocket, um, was able to squeeze through, and it didn't, it wasn't fully open either. So, so all that happened was that we had a mist, like a small uh, cloud, you can see in the picture, of uh, nitrous oxide vapor, which was leaking out of the rocket. Luckily, this system, uh, sorry, this error solved itself um, a few seconds after the decoupling of the fueling hose uh, by the pressure inside the nitrous tank, just pushing the, the one-way valve closed, which is how it's intended to work. But it didn't immediately happen like that. So, so this was another stress factor uh, on the launch rail. Obviously, it's, it's quite a lot of stress already launching a rocket that you spent the last two years working on, even though you've tested everything rigorously uh, from home. So having this thrown into the mix was no pleasant experience, but uh, we managed to navigate around it. Then the second error which hit after we thought we had solved the um, the fueling error was an ignition system failure, which is quite crucial on a rocket that you want to launch. Um, so what happened was that in our ignition circuitry, we have quite a lot of checks. So we have um, some AND gates, which are the logic that uh, tells the actual ignition system to fire, which needs a, a high signal from the rocket and a high signal from mission control. Uh, if it does not get this, then the rocket won't launch. Now. At the launch site in Portugal, we had uh, a electrical setup, which looked like a, we had a generator at the launch rail, and then we had another generator at mission control. This uh, caused a ground loop, which then fried this AND gate. So now this AND gate uh, didn't work anymore, which meant that uh, when, um, I don't remember which part of the AND gate worked, but basically when one side of the system, so that could be either uh, the mission control or the rocket, sent the high signal, the AND gate would never open. So, so the final part of the ignition system would never receive a green flag to turn on the igniter. So the igniter never turned on. So this resulted in the rocket just spilling its fuels out on the, on the area around the launch pad. And this is probably one of the worst feelings I think I've had in my life uh, after traveling 3,000 kilometers from Denmark with around a, a metric ton, quite literally, of cargo, uh, including the launch rail itself and our support equipment and the rocket too. Then seeing the rocket empty its propellants onto the floor on the launch pad was uh, as, br as brutal as brutal experience. So, um, but yeah, we, we basically had to scrub the first launch attempt, but we were granted uh, very generously by the Portuguese authorities another launch window around an hour later. So we took it and we went through a bunch of checks on the rocket to make sure that actually it was ready to do another launch attempt. And this is one of the beauties of, of bi-liquid rockets is that um, you can just refuel and try again if something doesn't work. Um, so we did exactly that. However, now we only had enough nitrous oxide left for half a tank. So we could not fuel the rocket completely. Of course, we had enough fuel, but that doesn't matter if we don't have enough oxidizer. So we could not fuel the rocket completely, um, but we went with what we had, basically. And the ignition system we hadn't really figured out what was wrong with it at this point. So, so instead, we chose to rely on some local pyrotechnicians that were present on site to a some of the other teams and uh, our team included uh, with um, like off the shelf uh, motors and also ignition uh, devices like electrical matches, for example. And they actually had a remote control system which was completely decoupled from our system. So. So the way we coordinated this with them was that 
uh, we would install one of their ignition systems inside our engine. And keep in mind, we've never tested this because obviously we've been using our own ignition system at home. But, but either way, we installed their ignition system inside our engine. And then, then we told them that, so when we do the countdown uh, from 10, the terminal count, you press the ignition start at 7. So T minus 7 seconds. So this was very rudimentary. But again, we were at a point where we had to uh, grasp for straws, more or less. So we took any chance we could. and. Um, we couldn't do much else than just say, uh, all right, guys, we, this is one shot, uh, the one shot we have left, so let's go, right? We just have to have to go for it. And it worked uh, quite incredibly. So we had liftoff, and um, we saw a nice stability margin. Uh, this is based off of the data we extracted from the rocket after landing. So we saw a nice stability margin at departure. However, we only uh, had half a tank, uh, like what I mentioned. And during flight, we saw a maximum velocity of around 200 meters per second. Uh, that's around, I think it's 700 kilometers per hour. And then we saw an apogee of 2.2 uh, kilometers. And I'm going to show you a video now. I don't think it has sound, but I'll show you a video now of uh, the bottom facing camera of the rocket. So we had a camera installed uh, right next to the engine, which is looking down. So that's what I'm going to show you now. And now for the remainder of the video, the rocket is just falling down. There's not much to see except that it's spinning around. Um, so let's just move on. So we could see that at Apogee from the downwards facing camera that we had a nice drogue chute deployment. And then on the right, you'll see our upwards facing camera. Now, remember I told you that we had a main chute deployment problem. This is where that happens. So think about the fact that we are seeing the drogue chute, so the initial parachute in the downwards facing camera. This means that the rocket is heading one way and the parachute is in the other way. So now what happens is that the rocket is getting pulled around uh, by the drogue chute. So the rocket suddenly makes a, a flip in the air. And this flip was enough to pull out the, the main parachute prematurely. This parachute was not secured mechanically. It was just held in there by the, the pressure of the uh, deployment barrel, the deployment tube. And since we had not anticipated that this would happen, uh, we, we didn't have enough uh, force in holding in the main parachute. So the main parachute fell out prematurely. And that led to a, a partial deployment of the main parachute, but in such a way that we were not able, the rocket, uh, when actually deploying the main parachute, uh, could not salvage uh, the deployment. So this is how it looked going down. We had a descent rate of around 30 meters per second. And you can see here on the picture that you have the, the pink main chute at top, uh, on the top here. And it's kind of like all coiled up um, in, a, uh, in a pile of cloth, basically. It's supposed, when it's actually deployed, it's supposed to have a diameter of around four meters. So it's supposed to be almost as wide as the rocket is long. And you can see here that is quite clearly not the case. So the main chute had entangled itself in all of its cords while it was falling from, um, from Apogee. And this resulted in an impact of the rocket with the ground, where it saw a G-load uh, of in excess of 100 Gs. So uh, the rocket took quite a beating uh, on its uh, landing, so to speak. So the liquid feed section, uh, the section just above the engine but below the tank, now became an impromptu crumble zone, kind of like you have in Formula One cars with the, the, nose, uh, the nose of the car that's supposed to crumble to absorb energy if, in case of a crash. Um, and overall, the rocket suffered lots of internal damages. The, the flight computer, which was situated right below the payload, uh, had the payload crashing down on top of it. So you can see how destroyed the flight computer is on the picture here. But 
uh, miraculously, when we had removed our power supply units from the power supply, which were the most destroyed because these were on top, uh, we could actually power it up with a bench top power supply and extract the data. So we ended up still getting full flight data from this, despite of the uh, main shoot deployment error. And that, led, like, that allowed us to, to do a full analysis of, of what had happened. Um, which was incredible. So even though even though you might think that, that this is only a partial success, uh, I would argue that given that this is the first European bi-liquid rocket uh, developed by students ever to be launched, uh, and the rocket came down in, in one piece still, uh, <laughs> slightly, slightly defect, but still one piece, um, this was a, an astounding success, nothing short thereof. So I think I'll just end it uh, on that note. And if you have any questions, I'd like to answer them. I have uh, also pretty in-depth knowledge of some of the, the technical systems of the rocket. So, so anything, anything can go. So uh, just uh, shoot me some questions, and I'll answer. Thank you for listening, and thank you for the uh, opportunity for even talking. Thank you yeah. so much. For your presentation it was really nice to to see a real application uh, flying uh, a uh, a liquid 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 rocket uh be prop um it was amazing amazing to see the flight and everything that you you pointed out about the development and building the rocket and also uh, i personally i was very anxious and excited <laughs> by your by your flight and me and uh, the bio and last team we were talking almost every day about the rock and uh, if you if you could uh, to see the a live stream video or something like that because we, we wanted to see uh, the dragonfly and uh, it it is a great opportunity to to have you presenting uh, the launch here and also uh, I I and uh, our, 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 our of our team, we would would like to to congratulate you and your team because of Thank this. You. Yes, uh, it, it, it it's not easy. It's very complex. It's rocket science, and uh, <laughs> you did an amazing job. So congratulations and. Uh, of course, thank you uh, for participating in this in this um, live stream with us. So I will pass the word for João Pedro. He has some questions, and I think the questions it it's going to be something very interesting for answers. And uh, João, it's with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for for giving the opportunity even to for them start to be able to present the launch here. It's a massive, uh, massive, yeah, massive right. achievement. So yeah, thanks a lot. It's it really awesome to hear from you everything. And I personally appreciate the fact that you are so open about everything because uh, we think that this is really great to, to be able to, like uh, Adam Forrest said, to be in a community where everyone learns from, from the other, right? So, so you said some things like, oh, we had some trouble with our valve. So right now, other teams, they, they can be something like, oh, I, I need to check my valves because the guys from Damstar had some problem with their valves. So I, I need to check mine, maybe triple check, quadruple check or, or something like yeah, that. Or, or do a, a thing that we do around here that is the buddy system, right? So we have uh, a, small, uh, a small question here. Uh, we'd like to know a brief uh, answer from you on what it is the support from ESA like? So actually, uh, we were not in contact with ESA oh. much at all. So so the correspondence with ESA was more or less just me sending an email inquiring about uh, a European rocketry challenge. And then immediately after that, we were set up uh, to communicate with Portugal Space. So from a student point of view, uh, that was all I, I saw from ESA. I'm quite sure they might have done a lot of stuff behind the scenes, which I don't know of. Um, but from my point of view, that, that was all I saw. Oh, OK. Um, and from Bruno here from the last team, uh, what kind of things you had to do to prepare a 3D printed liquid engine? Because we know you have to do some cleaning <laughs> and some things like that. So what kind of works you have to put on? So OK, actually, that, th thank you so much for that question, because uh, I was on the engine design team, so I can answer this very well. Um, so 
So we had a goal from the beginning being that uh, we don't want to do a lot of work on this engine when it comes out of the printer. Obviously, it still has to undergo heat treatment and, and some of these mechanical processes for it to, to be even uh, like mechanically sound. Um, but uh, we had a, a criteria being that basically we should not touch it much. So all we did after it came off the printer was that we uh, sanded down, literally uh, with, my, with my hand, I sanded down some, some surfaces, which were for the O-rings. And then we uh, tapped some holes for some screws. And, and that's it. That's it. And then we installed the injector and the oxtome and went testing. Oh, so, so these other prices were machine, not, not 3D printed, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we had an injector and a, a top piece for the engine, which were uh, machined in aluminum. OK. So I think that's it for questions from here. Let me check here on the YouTube stream. Uh, I think I have a question from Victor that is here on the on this on the meet as well. So Victor, can you speak? If, if you? Yeah, you mentioned something about uh, a upcoming European Space Challenge. Something about that. If you if you could say a few words about this uh, the upcoming event, this idea. Yeah. So actually, the the first instance of this event was uh, our launch uh, among a few other teams who also launched. So this year, in this uh, October, around a month ago, actually, they had a pilot event, uh, which was uh, the European Rocketry Challenge, the first edition of it. So they're planning to repeat this uh, indefinitely, I presume, uh, kind of like Space Bar America Cup does, uh, every year, such that uh, European teams no longer have to take the rockets to the US which can, at least in, in our case, it would have been quite expensive, the shipping of our components, because we had to bring so much stuff, right? We had to bring our launch rail, we had to bring all, all our support equipment. So it's prohibitively expensive. Uh, but now with the competition in Europe, um, suddenly there's a window, uh, there's an opportunity for European teams uh, to enter the uh, student rocketry scene uh, at a much lower price point, because they don't have to go to the US anymore. Perfect, thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Victor, for your question. So I think that's it. On behalf of Alaska, I'd like to thank you for your time, Rasmus. It was really, really great hearing from a team. So as you said at the beginning, I thought that was very funny. On the other side of the fence, right, we heard from yeah. Adam that is on the uh, Launch Canada, and he was talking about the, the innovation and everything related to that. And then you came on and talked about what you and your team worked on for two years. So yeah, everyone, rocketry is really hard. And they worked really hard for two years to launch this rocket that was the first bipropellant uh, rocket, liquid rocket from a student team in Europe. So that was really nice. It was really nice having you here, Erasmus. And thank you so much. Thank you for your time and your presentation here again. Thank you.